Son, so what you gon' do? Spend it with my family, chill with the crew. We gon' share gifts, you don't have to spend loot. We celebrate culture, our African roots. Control our destiny. Welcome to night two of Kwanzaa. Habargani, what's the news? December the 27th, today the principle is Kujijakalia, self-determination. We light the red candle. The principle of Kujijakalia means to speak for ourselves, define ourselves, to think for ourselves, and do for ourselves. Welcome back, everyone. Habarigani. Kujichagalia. Kujichagalia. Yes, you are. Kujichagalia means self-determination, to define ourselves, name ourselves, create for ourselves, and speak for ourselves. You're definitely doing a great job, Shalanda, so I'm very impressed. And you sound great, too. Asante Sana. That means thank you in Swahili. Okay, you're very welcome. <laughs> and you're looking good in those earrings too. Oh, thanks queen, so are you. Ahem, I got these from Say, Say That, that Accessories. accessories. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Say That Accessories, we have the beautiful owner, uh, Naomi Something to Say Johnson, who's the founder of San Antonio Kwanzaa Coalition. And we also have Ms. Deborah Jarman, CEO and President of San Antonio African American Community Archive Museum, aka SACAM. Yes, welcome ladies. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> so, first question, let's hop it off. So, Kuji Chagolia means self-determination and you both are leaders of very prominent organizations doing obviously very impactful work. I kind of want to hear from you in your own words. Um, what exactly does this principle mean for you personally? So starting with Deborah. Wow. Well, being a baby boomer, yes, I know you couldn't tell. Anywho, being a baby boomer and my mother was from Selma, Alabama. Oh wow. It was really all about you have to be better, you have to make your own way. Whatever you think you can do, you can do. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't. And from that upbringing, and also being a, a PK, a preacher's kid, mm -hmm. I created a personal mission statement, which was to provide a legacy of love and service for my community and for my family. And I think the best way I can serve my community is to remind them of who they are. Mm. And when we know who we are, when we understand that we are truly um, heirs of kings and queens, then we don't walk around with our head down. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I could go on and on and on. But this queen right here, I know, has something to say about that. <laughs> Very much pun intended. <laughs> So self-determination to me is my favorite part of that principle is to speak for ourselves because my name is something to say because it was a it was a funny thing I came up with because my sisters I'm the oldest of three girls and they always would say you always got something to say and when I took that on it actually manifested itself into way more than I knew that my voice could carry and the innate pride of my blackness, it made me have to speak for myself. Because I, if you allow for someone else to tell your story, you're no longer the narrator. So for me, it's, it's so important for all of us to create our own legacy, as she said, but also to make sure that you are defining yourself and also to speak for yourself. So, especially in the time that we're in now, it's so integral that whenever we walk into a room, I uh, have a practice that I never tell a person what all I have ever achieved. 
if I run my resume and I'm a humble person, I don't do that. A lot of people will look at me and look at where I come from. I come from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is a very tough city. So to accomplish all that I've done from there and living in San Antonio in five years, a person would say, wow, you should be, they would tell me what I should be and not look at who I am. Ooh, so say that. me okay. speaking for myself is saying, hey, I'm a roundaway girl. We can have, we can, look, I'm from the Brew City. We could throw a beer back. We could have a, a hot dog or something. We could play spades. But at the same time, I can conduct myself in spaces that, that look for imperfections in me because of how I present myself. So they, they want me to fail. Watch out for the days. <laughs> so how important do you think it is for black people to become self-determined? Ms. Deborah. Oh, well, one of the reasons why SACAM even exists is so that we can tell our story. And again, getting back to the queen over here, something <laughs> to say, when we tell our own story, when we are determined, when we define ourselves for who we are, mm -hmm. then can anyone tell us who we're not? And so often we hear who we are not. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go back again. I can tell you who I am. That part. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. And let me tell you who I am. Yes. You can't tell me who I am. Mm -hmm. Can anyone tell your story that like you can? That's right. Mm -hmm. And we have to know our story, which again goes back to say Cam. Mm -hmm. If we don't know our story, then we can't tell it. That's right. We have to know our past. We have to know today. And we have to be real clear about what tomorrow looks like. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. What are your thoughts? Ooh, I gotta come find that. Right. <laughs> <Of course. laughs> so mm. when I think about the impact of what Kwanzaa is and the inference of what Kwanzaa is because when you present Kwanzaa to the masses they say oh it's a made up holiday oh it's made up after Hanukkah and what Dr. Uh, Milana Karenga saw was a space for us to create a significant celebration to say I'm proud to be black but I understand in being proud, prideful in that in that space you have to still hold yourself accountable to these things because you have to leave your community better than where you found it. You have to be self-determined. You have to unify. You have to do business with each other. You have to know your purpose. You also have to have faith. These are all the things that encompasses Kwanzaa and also being creative because a lot of people, especially with me being and you all being creatives, they look at it as a passe thing. They underpay artists. They don't look at us to have significance to the community where a lot of our foundation came from, creativity. But we, it's because we were determined to speak through our art that the significance is there. So with Kwanzaa, self-determination is one of, I'm glad it's a tenant because we have to know and we have to push through to have our culture where it deserves to be. Right. Our culture is American culture but a lot of people don't receive it as such. Oh, they pretend they don't receive it uh. as such because, okay, again, I'm dating myself. Mm -hmm. The movie 10, Bo Derek. Mm -hmm. People thought that she Those braids. <laughs> <laughs> that she invented braids. Oh, you mean the boxer braids? <laughs> uh. <laughs> so we, we, uh. <laughs> we can go on and on and we on. We can. Yeah. And our culture really is being hijacked yes but we have to be self-determined yes mm -hmm. to keep it for us yes and to um use it as you said to better our community mm -hmm. to better our people to better our families and there's nothing wrong with having safe spaces for black folks because people look at it as being exclusive mm -hmm. And with Kwanzaa, it is exclusive. And the, the uh, tagline for this year's Kwanzaa was unapologetically black and undeniably excellent. <clears throat> because you can't look over us anymore, especially in San Antonio. We're the smaller population in the city. And we have the, the smallest celebrations. Our celebrations often go overlooked. Mm -hmm. We've had a long-standing Juneteenth. 
but it wasn't until this year because of the social justice issues that came to the forefront. It's not that they never existed, people just started paying attention. Mm -hmm. And because of the, the widespread response, oh, let's figure out all the black stuff that's been mattering and let's put into that. So then that way we can seem like we're on their side. And it's like, well, we've been doing that. So Kwanzaa's been going on since 1966. Mm -hmm. right. And, and uh, Juneteenth has been going on longer than that. So you've had these celebrations, you've, we've had these cultural safe spaces for us and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just when we speak up about it, we need to be affirmed in that. Because mm -hmm. sometimes, uh, even sometimes, a lot of times, our voices are overridden with, well, what about us? Mm -hmm. When that same extension isn't leaned toward us, or it isn't extended back to us. It mm -hmm. isn't, hey, come sit at my table. Is mm -hmm. well, why you do at your own table? Because you wouldn't let me you sit at yours. Me sit at yours. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. If you invited me to the table, we can yeah, have a conversation. Nice we can learn from one another. Mm -hmm. The fabric of America definitely has a lot of kente in it. It has a lot of Ankara in it. It has a lot of blood, sweat, and tears from our community in it. But it's for so long, people keep trying to shout it out. Yes. <laughs> they just keep trying to, why are you bringing that up? Y'all not supposed to be talking about that. It's like, well, why not? It's American it, it's, history. It's our history. Our story is a part of American history. And I want to just go back real quick, if I can, to the table, mm -hmm. because one of the things that I shared with someone maybe like two or three weeks ago, okay, so this is what inclusion looks like. Mm -hmm. You have to invite me to dinner. That's right. Mm -hmm. Allow me to sit at the table. Mm -hmm. Allow me to order off the same menu. Yes. Mm -hmm. Allow me to talk to the server. Yes. And then when dinner is over, mm -hmm. allow me to stay at the table mm -hmm. and be included in the after dinner conversation. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's what inclusion looks like. Yes. I don't want to just, I don't want to just have a seat at the table. Right. right. You have to recognize yes. that I am at the table mm -hmm. and that I have something to, to say. say. Yes. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, so good. I have a question. So what if the world loved black people as much as it loved Ooh, black culture? We do you Can you say that a little bit louder? What? <laughs> Of people in the back. <laughs> what if the world loved black people as much as it loves black culture? Ooh. Where would we be? Hmm. Light years ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I think about um, when, you, when you say it like that, I don't even think from the creative side, I think from the um, inventive side. Oh, absolutely. A lot yeah. of people, even just even not just in the, the 20th century, if you go back to the 19th century, a lot of people don't understand that William Shakespeare's plays was written by his servant. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know that. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. brilliant, those, those, um, those dramatic pieces, just, I mean, because I, I love William Shakespeare. I'm a writer, too. And just thinking of, I always love dramatic scenes. I love the the dun 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 moment, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a lot of that wrapped into that like that really wordy language that he uses, right. and just that that mind frame. I can't speak to where his creative mind space was, mm -hmm. but to have someone so brilliant and so how can I put it, just so small in your world. And he has all of this magnitude of creativity and you take it from him and you make it yours, you package it, you, you take some, some game soap and you put it in a Tide box and you sell it. Everyone's like, oh, Tide! It's like, no, game did this. I just put a <laughs> label on it. That's how our contribution to society has been for so long. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's really, like I said, light years ahead, we really would be. If, like I think about jazz, I just watched the, um, a documentary the other day on Netflix about a black jazz musician that I didn't even know about and I like jazz and they were just saying how brilliant he was and how at the time jazz was just this noise mm -hmm. and then now you have a Kenny G mm -hmm. and I'm like I like Kenny G but also how was jazz this like it was just this bastard music that because it wasn't big band it wasn't this Frank Sinatra sound and it was black faces on this this brilliant music these scores this just 
romanticized just sound that the masses saw as just jiggable music. Mm. How would the American music soundscape be if it were respected for the art that it was in that time? Mm -hmm. So we would be light years ahead if we just had that simple understanding of contribution. This is art. Like, I go on and on. Betty Boop was really black. If mm -hmm. people treated her as an icon, I mean, they saw it. They saw what she could be because she was white passing. Mm -hmm. But then years and years and years later, she's this iconic staple of American culture, but people still don't realize that she's black. She's a black woman. She's a black woman. Mm -hmm. So, if, ooh, 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 wait. Yeah. The Yellow Rose of Texas. Yes. That's a great one. A lot of people don't know that. It's a black woman. A lot of people don't know that. <laughs> okay, Can you hear me? Huh? Learn me something? Come on, learn me something. Oh, learn me something. <laughs> <laughs> you. What are we talking about? Can we share with the audience and with the Share with <laughs> The Yellow Rose of Texas. So, I, are you from Texas? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, there you go. So, really, I'm not either. But, uh... <laughs> Transplant gang! Transplant gang! Okay. Like, I guess I'm the only one sitting, sitting at this table that's originally from Texas. So, Emily West, who was a contemporary of uh, Travis, and the song was written around the legend of this woman and mm -hmm. Travis. She was a black woman from New York. Mm -hmm. And she is the yellow rose of Texas. Wow. Mm -hmm. But they don't want to tell you that. Mm -hmm. And that's like the state, uh, one of the state songs, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Did they like whitewash her? I'm pretty sure. I mean, I'm not familiar with the story. Yeah. This is the first contextual, you know, explanation that I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure. I mean. She was whitewashed for a long time. But now if you go to the Emily Morgan Hotel, Hotel down here. there is a historical marker that says she's a mulatto woman. Mm -hmm. But, you know, back in the day, if you had one drop, mm -hmm. that's, that's a way to make it sound nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But mulatto is still a derogatory term. It depends, right. it depends on the receipt. That's yeah, I don't necessarily okay. know the receipt of the intent. person. I don't know that's yeah. right. somewhere. I don't know. I'm using it. That okay. part. Come on, okay. bro. You better round me back around. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think it was mal uh, um, negative in connotation. I think it was descriptive. Mm -hmm. And to not say she was black. Okay. <laughs> that was, I think that's the important piece. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Recognizing that so many prominent figures within history actually were... Um, colored people, mm -hmm. real true colored <laughs> right. people. Um, and I think that, so to, going back to our principle, right, of self-determination, I think that is why we are advocates so hard for history being told correctly, for Cleopatra actually being the black woman. For oh, Nefertiti. no, not if she wasn't Elizabeth Taylor. No. I mean, no, God, no. For Nefertiti actually being black you yes. know um, specific movies documentaries things created and mm -hmm. depicting these women or men in their true nature it's extremely important because representation matters what i loved i don't know if you all were in on that wave of um lovecraft country oh oh my god lovecraft country i'm mm -hmm. sure you haven't heard of it no. it was this really big Beautiful thing that got us all through quarantine as black folks Beautiful. um the story um i want to say his name i think it's h-w-e-w -E lovecraft that was the author mm -hmm. but what made him so significant was he was a white man mm -hmm. and the story was based on white folks and having magical powers and how uh, that tale kind of woven into American society mm -hmm. and what they did they took it and turned it on its ear and made it based around the green book oh so they would uh, have all these um, these run-ins with the wizards who were white and the family had magic too but they were getting it back from the white folks and they have all these adventures they talk about science they go through time they even went back to like um, when, we were, when we were in Africa and how structured we were and how civilized we were. It was just a beautiful display mm -hmm. in a TV show. Mm -hmm. And so- 10 episodes. 10 episodes, <laughs> they were like action packed. It yeah. was the whole, every time it was something different. I love how they jumped around the characters because some characters were either on the forefront or in the background, but everybody had a significant piece 
in the mm -hmm. story. So to take something like that back, mm -hmm. and that that is, I will spoil the story for some. At the on the last episode, she said we're taking our magic back. Mm -hmm. I said, come on, 2020, <laughs> you ain't failed me. <laughs> You're not failing me because I think that's. I, what we got out of that um, the summer with, with George Floyd and all of those things that woke the world up, mm -hmm. we did take our voices back. We, mm -hmm. we, we all found some type of level of mm -hmm. self-determination to say, you know what, no more. Mm -hmm. I'm going to speak out. I don't care if I'm just this little small fry mm -hmm. in, in the back of the pantry. You're going to hear my voice in some capacity. Mm -hmm. So even before then, in 2019, when I formed the coalition, I looked all around me and I was just like, where is Kwanzaa? Mm -hmm. And I had been to Kwanzaa celebrations in San Antonio, but not anything, community. not community based, mm -hmm. not community wide. Mm -hmm. So I had to find my voice and just say, you know what? I'm contributing back to the community because I want to be the change and I want to see it. I think that is beautiful. You mm -hmm. ladies Definitely. have just y'all taught me things and so inspiring so where can we find you you can find me online at the san antonio kwanzaa coalition uh you can also find me on instagram at naomi something number two say deborah where can we find you girl where can we find you girl <laughs> So, uh, drum roll. <laughs> Our newest exhibit space will open in February right. at so La Bellita. Yeah. Oh. So, we're excited about that. And what's really amazing about mm -hmm. being at La Bellita, that was the original home of St. Philip's College. Oh, wow. Now, yes. The building that we're in is was not one of the college buildings, but okay. we're on the campus. So we're right. excited about that. Yay. But you can find us online right now. Okay. At SACAM. That's S A A A A A C A M dot org. SACAM dot org. Mm -hmm. We have a number of digital exhibits. We have uh, research papers. We have virtual discussions. Every fourth Saturday, we put something out virtually uh, where you can come in and learn about your history. We also have, we're talking about whitewashing history, our history. We have a racial education program for kindergartners through 12th grade. And every month, we have a different topic. So we have a completely separate uh, button on our website for racial education. And so that's for students, teachers, parents, Great. and uh, mm -hmm. kids of all hue, but to teach them about the significance of our culture. All right. We're speaking for ourselves. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I Santi Sana. Oh, You're very, very The three tests. Once, long ago, three tigers came to Africa. They went to the country of animals and made this terrible announcement. From now on, this land will be ruled by tigers. We are, after all, the strongest, fastest, and wisest of all animals. Therefore, we are the only fit rulers, they claimed. A little mouse spoke up from the crowd. But we have a council where we make our decisions together. We don't need or want any ruler. One of the tigers let out a roar so loud and fierce that the poor mouse started running and didn't stop until he was in the land of the humans. To this day, he lives in the houses of humans. Her cousin, the field mouse, misses her terribly. The other animals didn't like the idea much either, but they looked at those tigers' big claws and sharp teeth and were afraid to speak. These tigers were even bigger than the lion. We will collect taxes and we'll also change the name of this country. From now on, this will be Tigerland and you will call yourselves servants of the tigers, they said. Finally, Anansi spoke. Great tigers, it is clear that you are strong, fast, and wise, but just so that everyone will know for sure that you are stronger, faster, and wiser than anyone else, let's have a contest. Anansi suggested. The tigers liked the idea, so Anansi continued. Let us prepare ourselves. 
Then tomorrow we will choose someone to compete against each of you. So the tigers left and the animals held a private meeting to discuss what to do. The next morning, the animals were ready. The tigers came to the council circle. The strongest tiger, he spoke first. Who will compete against me, he asked. I will, said the tiny voice of the field mouse. The tiger laughed until he cried. This will not take long, he said. Who will race me, roared the swiftest tiger. I will, said the tortoise. This is no contest at all, shouted the tigers. Hare told the third tiger, I must bring you to the home of the owl. She is the wisest of all creatures. We will see, said the tiger. First was the contest of strength. The field mouse brought the tiger to a large clearing. They each stood at one edge of the clearing with one end of a rope. Between them was placed hundreds of big thorn bushes. When she gave a signal of two short tugs on the rope, the tiger was to start pulling. The loser would get dragged across the thorns. The tiger laughed at the little mouse and said that he was ready. She gave the signal and the tiger began to pull. What he didn't know was that behind the field mouse standing in the forest was a great bull elephant holding on to the rope. So while the tiger pulled on one end, the elephant pulled on the other. The tiger got dragged all the way through the thorn bushes yelling, ouch, 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 all the way. If this is how strong the mice are, I would hate to see what the other animals can do, he shouted. Next was the race. The tortoise brought the fastest tiger to a five mile stretch of road in the forest. At each mile marker, one of the tortoise's cousins was hiding. To the tiger, you know, they all look alike. When the race began, tiger went zooming by, leaving the tortoise in his dust. As he was coming to the first mile marker, the tiger was laughing to himself. How could a tortoise think he could outrun me, he said. Just then, Tortoise came out from his hiding place behind the mile marker. What took you so long, Mr. Tiger, he asked politely. Tiger was shocked. How did you get here so fast, he screamed. Tortoise didn't answer. He just slowly plodded off toward the next marker. The tiger zoomed past him and ran up at top speed to the second mile marker, only to find Tortoise sitting there waiting. I really thought tigers were faster than this, he said, sounding very disappointed. I'll beat you yet, shouted the tiger as he sped to the next marker. At this third marker, Tortoise was sitting down playing a game of Mancala with Anansi and laughing about how easy the race was. Tiger couldn't believe his eyes. At the fourth marker, Tortoise was asleep, snoring loudly. Tiger sped by him so fast that he left the tortoise spinning like a top. Finally, Tiger was racing toward the finish line. Tortoise was nowhere in sight. Tiger was running at full speed. Nothing could stop him now. Yet as he got closer to the line, he noticed a little round thing sitting there. It must be a rock, he told himself. But as he got closer, he saw that that little head and those four little legs, and he knew Tortoise was already there. It's impossible, he screamed. But no matter how much he screamed, it didn't change the fact that Tortoise had won the race. Now the hare was bringing the third tiger to the home of the wise old owl, but, she had, but the hare kept complaining of stomach pains and said that he couldn't walk very well. Can't you get someone else to show me the way, said the tiger angrily. I'm the only one who knows the way, whispered hare. It's a secret. Tiger was irritated. Then you'll just have to ride on my back, he said. They rode on for a little while. But the hare kept letting himself slide off the tiger's back so that they weren't making much progress. If you bring me to my house, I can get my saddle, the hare suggested. That way I won't slip off. So the tiger brought the hare home and let hare put a, ha a saddle on him. And if you let me use these reins, hare continued, I can steer you left or right without talking so much. I have a sore throat, you know. Tiger agreed. Then the hare went into his house and came out wearing spurs and carrying a whip. Wait a minute, said Tiger. What's all that for? Oh, I just wear these spurs for show, hare said. And the whip is so I can keep the flies off you while you're giving me a ride. Okay, said the tiger, but be careful. So they rode on, but not to the owl's home. They went right to the council circle. 
All the other animals were gathered there. When Hare came in sight of the other animals, he dug his spurs into the tiger's sides and snapped that whip against the tiger's backside and yelled, Giddy up, horsey! That tiger went jumping and howling through the crowd, looking about as foolish as a fool can look. All the animals laughed and laughed. The other tigers were so embarrassed that they pleaded with the hare to please, please stop. The hare got off the tiger's back and took his saddle and reins. Those tigers agreed never to come back to Africa again. That's why, to this day, there are no tigers in the forest of Africa. And everyone got along fine in the land of animals with everyone as equals, no kings, no queens, no rulers. Kuji Shagugula, self-determination. <laughs> that was so much. It was, it was a lot, but come on, you always have something to <laughs> say. <laughs> indeed, indeed, and I couldn't have had such a powerful conversation without a powerful woman sitting next to me. Aww. So it was right on time, this whole thing. It was. I'm so excited for the rest of the week. I know, right? It's just like, oh, why is it only seven days? <laughs> but, you know, um, be raw. They're encouraging all of you out there to not just exercise the Kwanzaa principles for, principles for seven days, but to do them every day. Kwanzaa should be a part of your life. Speaking of a part of your life. All right, here we go. It's history time. History time. So we're going to actually talk about two uh, organizations okay. for Kuji Shagalia. And one, are, one of the organizations is mm -hmm. the fraternal organizations, which All would be right. the Masons, and the Greek organizations. All right, Greeks. So in 1775, Prince Hall uh, founded the Prince Hall Order of Masons. Mm -hmm. And in 1871, the San Antonio Lodge, number 22, mm -hmm. became the first black Masonic Lodge in Texas. Wow. According to the grand historian, Brother Fred Jackson, Masonic Lodges provided African Americans access into the corridors of power and the mainstream of American society where men must meet as equals. The Masonic Lodges, therefore, became the institutions of choice outside of churches that provided African American leaders a way by which the people could attain a higher cultural standing. Just because the Grand Lodge of England mm -hmm. did not charter or accept charters from black men, mm -hmm. they said, oh, that's okay. Right. We will do it ourselves, that's which is right. all about Kuji Shagalia. Mm -hmm. And fast forwarding to the Greek organizations, they provided support to students desiring kinship and a support system at our nation's mm -hmm. historically black colleges and universities. Here in San Antonio, the Alpha Ta Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Incorporated mm -hmm. is the oldest Greek organization of what we affectionately, affectionately, <laughs> okay, I need more coffee. <laughs> I know what's flavor, I need more coffee. Uh -huh. We affectionately call the Divine Nine. The Greek organizations grew to be change agents in our community, including Head Start and WIC, and a lot of people wow. don't know that. No. Greek and the Masons are true examples of Kuji Shakalia. All right, so with that tidbit, <laughs> we could go on and on and on we about could. our excellence yes. and all that we accomplished. It's the end of the night, I'm sad. We have a few more days left, though. Yes, but we can't forget to give a wonderful and thankful and gracious and big old air hugs that are sanitary to Natura for all of our beautiful foliage for our Kwanzaa display. Thank you so much for your contribution to this celebration. Thank you. And thank you for making our community a little bit brighter and greater. Oh, we have one more thing to do. Yeah. All right, All San, right Antonio. San Antonio. Remember, stay messed up. <laughs> <laughs>
check roots. On December 26, goodbye Saint Nick. I light a black candle. Look, ooh, it's lit. First day of Kwanzaa. Umoja means unity. Ain't messing with my click. Melanated, check the drip. So, 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 so. Determination is the mantra. Constant elevation like the Haitians when they conquered their colonizers. Like a real life Wakanda. True believers. Hey.